Today on Zero Deliton, I'll be doing something a little different, and hopefully this will turn into its own little series on this channel if everybody likes it. But today, I'll be taking apart this Perkin Elmer Sci-X API 150EX, which is a spray mass spectrometer. As some of you know, I help my friend Adam work on stuff for his eBay business, which is called High Tech Stuff. Now, why is it called High Tech Stuff? It's because we literally get into High Tech Stuff. So we'll be turning this down and getting a good look at all the parts inside. You won't believe how this thing works. It's nuts. Now that the cover's off, I can take a little bit of a look on the inside and see what's going on. So here in the front, there's two ports for vacuum pumps to be connected. And uh, we have one that's connected over on this area. It goes up through here, all through this tubing, and connects to a turbo pump over here. That uh, terminal -like molecular pump is already removed. We have a, another turbo molecular pump right here. And uh, for the most part, most of the gas is pumped out by uh, the pumps that are connected to the outside fittings. But the turbo molecular pumps, what they do is they get that very little bit of uh, gas or atmosphere that's inside of the test chamber. And these can go down to very low uh, levels of vacuum. They're good for that. Uh, we have here the ion gauge. This basically lets us know how much uh, gas pressure is still in the system and uh, we'll get into how this works a little bit later on in the video but uh, the first couple of things that I have to do is disconnect all of this section right here pull the ion gauge and pull the thermal molecular pump and then we can get a good idea of what's going on inside the uh, upper test chamber here it's a very cool device one thing to take a look at before I take off uh, this panel here is we have a high voltage uh, ion source right here it's basically uh, just a high voltage uh, power. So 8 kV is probably going to be in the uh, negative. So a negative potential, 8 kV, comes out through here. And what it does is it charges all of the little particles that end up going through the nozzle on the inside and spray out inside of the assembly right here. So that's what turns what we want to measure into the actual ions where we add a, uh, an electron on there and then uh, we can control how that ion interacts with the quadrupole mass analyzer on the inside. We can see some of that already. Right, we have these uh, four metal rods in here. And uh, that would be the quadrupole mass analyzer. We'll get into how that works, of course. But yeah, both turbo pumps are removed. And uh, right now, I'm going to pull this off, see what's on the other side of that cover and get into pulling out all these cards on uh, the other side. Well then uh, Adam here decided that he was going to help out and taking this apart a little bit because who can say no to something like this. But now anyway we have a couple of cards that go into the back. So this right here I think it's for the quadrupole uh, system on top for the RF uh, that needs to be on the quadrupole math analyzer. We have a couple of different other cards here. This one, the it is blank module. That's uh, special. <laughs> uh, lots of excitement there. Uh, it's the system controller, so probably the brain bits. Um, it's probably for generating some of the RF. Got uh, DAX here, so digital analog controllers, and then uh, for measuring how much of an atmosphere inside the test module. A whole bunch of test points on here. Let's see what this one is. Uh, lens. That's interesting. Uh, I don't know if there's a an optical lens in here, but there certainly could be an Einstein lens for the uh, particle acceleration style of uh, physics going on in the uh, sensor. Let's see back here. Tune to it. Let's see a little power supply there. Yeah. We'll pull all these cards out and pop the covers off on them and take a look at them too later on. Here's what the back looks like. So all the cards plug in uh, these ports right here. Uh, got a slightly different connector here. Looks like we have some possible discolorization on that port, which might be why it ended up here at our shop. It's uh, right here. I think it uh, could be high voltage module or one of the high voltage power supplies. So we'll take a look at that inside. See what's all going on there. Another little probably power supply here. And this is the turbo molecular pump uh, speed controller. So this is what runs the 
uh, multi-phase uh, electric motor in the turbo pumps but at this point I think I'm going to now take off the quadrupole mass analyzer and uh, ion sensor head in the back here so the sensor head and if you were to think about it the spray goes in this way it gets ionized and charged goes through the quadrupole mass analyzer as I said explain more about that later on comes this way and then the ion that uh, makes it through the quadrupole mass analyzer ends up going into the back here which is the cathode so it, it collects those positively charged no it's the anode and it collects those negatively charged um, ions that make it through the uh, mass analyzer here and uh, this is probably like the uh, the preamp that comes off of the uh, sensor head on the inside so of course as usual because nothing is easy looks like uh, getting that top section uh, separated from the rest of the unit is going to be a little tricky we got a couple of bolts uh, sorry nuts that need to be undone here and uh, now we have this section in here which looks to securely hold this top uh, section of the analyzer to this which looks like a air gap uh, transformer um, basically what it, I think it does is it takes the uh, RF that's generated by the uh, one of the cards and it couples the RF to the secondary and the secondary then puts the RF potential on two of those rods on the inside through these two inputs so basically primary secondary side uh, very fast switching somewhere in the uh, 1 to 2 megahertz range from what I read but yeah basically a coupling transformer uh, RF isolation transformer oh, cool stuff but uh, yeah, we're not gonna take that off for the time being but still plenty to remove yeah right here is uh, the turbo pump controller so this is what powers up and uh, controls the speed and operation of the turbo, turbo molecular pump pretty nice one and can be yours for the right price I'm sure after it gets new caps, because I'm sure it the needs new caps, they all do. Best service ever. Alright, uh, I want to see about removing that little blue power supply right down there on the bottom. I'm going to read off, uh, read off the specs here. Oh god, alright, let's see here. 6.5, 12 amps, 24 volts, 7 amps, 18 volts, 7 amps. Oh, 6.5, 12 amps, 24, 7, 24, 7. It basically says the same thing over again. Yeah, yeah. Lambda. Good, Lambda, good brand. Bad fan. So my friend had a power supply that said uh, bad fan. Um, so I scribbled out bad fan and wrote use in well ventilated areas. <laughs> <laughs> he saw that. He thought that was great. All right. Let's take a look at the inside of the quadrupole mass analyzer. Dun 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 dun. All right, so here we have uh, four rods. So uh, what I think happens is uh, two of the rods is gonna steady DC voltage, and then uh, the other two rods have an opposed RF uh, that modulates back and forth. And what ends up happening is when the spray comes in, those ions, because they have a charge on them, uh, you can control where they go, just like you could the electrons in a CRT tube. So what ends up happening is uh, the ions, because there's RF, uh, positive and negative going back and forth is that the ions will oscillate and depending on how heavy they are they'll either collide and uh, group onto the rods or they'll go all the way through and that is dependent on the RF frequency that is uh, on those rods so that's how you select what you're looking for so say if you know what uh, the oscillation frequency is of a particular uh, atom or molecule you'll set the, uh, the frequency on the two rods, uh, the RF, and then uh, it'll resonate as it goes down through, and uh, that specific one will end up going all the way down and hitting the detector on the back. So, basically, you say, if we're looking for one thing, that one thing oscillates at X frequency, we put X frequency on the rods, and uh, if that, uh, that item, that molecule or atom is there, uh, it'll resonate, make it all the way through, and uh, won't get collected on 
the uh, quadrupole mass analyzer. You mean the four hydro, hy, hypodermic needles, man. Oh, yeah, that, that, I would not want to get impaled by that, that's for sure. <laughs> Bleed out very quickly. Uh, what does this here say? Ah, uh, let's see. Risk of electric shock. <laughs> not anymore. <laughs> well, there's always more than one way to unglue a canoe. So, uh, taking those bolts out there on the top of the nuts off. Uh, undid the Phillips screws that were holding this top carrier section of up here. So now the whole analyzer head should pull directly up and off. And we can uh, start to take a good look at that. But it's pretty well stripped down as far as it'll go. So time for the anti-marriage. All right, so the quadrupole mass analyzer sensor uh, head is now pulled off. We can uh, remove this section right here, which is, I think, the uh, high voltage input and the uh, the preamplifier for the actual uh, ion detector um, anode on the inside. So that should be step number one here. And uh, undo these four screws and pull the whole quadrupole analyzer hopefully out. We can take a look at what's inside. But this is uh, what we got so far. So, uh, let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and uh, remove this, and then uh, get to the back section. All right. So here's the uh, ion sensor. Can't say I've quite seen something like this before myself. It's rather interesting, actually. Well, it looks like there might be a top uh, a top plate and uh, this weird looking tube thing like a, some sort of a ion trap or something but uh that's weird that's cool uh, I wonder if Adam knows exactly how that works but uh, it definitely looks like it's the uh, ion detector and it appears to be capacitively coupled interesting and then uh, there's the back of the quadrupole mass analyzer so let's go ahead and open that up. At this point, according to the instructions, I should now be able to grab this handle and pull this section directly out so that we, we can see what's on the inside. However, I tell you, on the inside, it looks pretty busy and connected and doesn't want to easily come out. So it's time to invite Adam over and uh, have him yank the handle because uh, if he breaks it, uh, it's not my fault. Which is uh, a good thing if you're me. So, uh, yeah, let's do that. All right. Time to be a burly man and give it a good tug. Uh, I would check on the inside, too, just to make sure that you're, uh, you're feeling comfortable pulling it out. Because it looks like quite a few things are connected in there yet. Mm. And they're good. Yeah, that was my concern. Little, uh, crying. Possibly. Is it coming? Not yet. Mm. Yeah, because I saw the connections to uh, these two uh, RF insert points uh, run up on the inside, and that was my concern, just yeah, at yeah, yeah. how That's it looked in there. It doesn't look like those are connected to the uh, Want a light? to the tray that pulls out, but it may be. Oh wait, I got it. Oh, aha! Uh -huh, I broke it. No, those come out of there like that. <laughs> well, that's good. Yeah. Why isn't that on the instructions? I know, right? Oh wait, there are no instructions. Sure, there are. They're right there. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Actually, they are. Look, that's what those were. Oh, with a note, two and five, but there was only two. Two and five. This is two, that's five. <laughs> but then what's three and four? I thought, I thought one, I thought, uh, this was my thinking, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six. I think that's what these are. That's, this is that, I think. They could have made it more clear. <clears throat> they could have made that more clear. All right. All right. Now can um, we, now can we tug? Maybe. Oh, 
Oh, Jesus. It's not budging. It needs a little uh, mechanical persuasion. Percussive, uh, percussive, percussive maintenance. Percussive maintenance. Oh, worry. Well, we'll get the money shot eventually, right? Eventually. Eventually. All right, and we're good to go for the extraction. Ready for tip extraction? Ready for tip extraction. Here we go. Welcome to the Mark 9000 laser weapon. <laughs> That's crazy. That is pretty cool looking. Now that we have the entire quadrupole math analyzer assembly out, we can take a good look at the inside of it. So. Looks like we have some uh, inductors here, some capacitors here, so it probably forms an LC network with the quadrupole uh, rods here. So essentially what happens is uh, it's kind of like a CRT um, in, a, in a way where it uh, will draw in and accelerate ions because they have a charge. And there is a charge that's imposed on these rods as well as an alternating um, RF that is on those. So the RF will change back and forth. And depending on the weight of the actual ion that uh, you're, you're reading, it'll resonate with the frequency. So you can change the frequency based on what you're looking for. Do a sweep in the RF to see what's all inside of the materials that you're analyzing. But that's pretty awesome gear. I have a nice gold plating on those rods, let me tell you. And then this assembly sits right in here inside of the vacuum chamber. And what this is called right here is this is called a channel tron, which is basically an electron multiplier. So they have um, different um, potentials, potentials yeah. on these poles right here. And this right here is a deflector. So as the ion is traveling this way, it will deflect it down into this funnel right here. So it's a little like a photomultiplier then. It is. So each one of these are different stages then. They're different stages, exactly. Okay. And what happens is as soon as one of the ions hits any one of the sides of this, in, inside of this tube, it basically creates a multiplying effect for yeah. the electrons and then produces more electrons as it bounces back and forth down this tube. And there's a... Um, uh, there's uh, information online where they actually show you a picture of the multiplication of these But basically this right here is the final end plate where the detector is and that's where the signal finally comes out Yeah, it's, uh, it, it looks plate. like it's capacitively coupled to yeah. the outside too It sure is Wow, look at how thick that uh, PCB, PCB is. is Yeah They obviously uh, want that rigid It's very interesting and of course, I'm sure there's a bunch of amplifiers and other uh, passive high voltage stuff inside this case too. Yeah, I figure that's uh, all the pre-amplifier and filter section. Yeah, exactly. That may be interesting to look at as well. But yeah, that would sit right there approximately. And where it exits from the quadrupole, it just gets deflected by this uh, U-channel and then bounced into the funnel of the channel tron. Now there's no potential on the uh, the U-channel here, is there? I imagine there's something because it is she it, it it's it's going through a feed through so there's some sort a, of potential on there like a negative potential to yeah. to, to um, repel those electrons to repel the electrons exactly or the ions yeah or, yeah ions exactly very 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 interesting very, very cool very stuff. Well, say at uh, about this point, man, the only thing I uh, left to do is to start checking out what's inside of these boxes. They're magic boxes. Yeah, <laughs> they're magic boxes. Close enough. Close enough. You know, another thing to uh, mention is this right here is the beginning of the acceleration stage. Um, you can uh, actually see over here, there was some high voltage connectors that were going into these ports right here. So
So here's the circuit board that goes to the actual ion detector head. Uh, it looks like we have a couple of things down here. Two voltage regulators, one positive and one negative. Probably for sending power to an operational amplifier. Inside there it looks like there is a analog devices, either a DAC um, or a uh, digital to uh, analog controller. Discriminator, you know, probably for setting uh, the detector sensitivity and what will pass through and whatnot. little pass bank. Another uh, analog device chip right there. And uh, more settings, of course, uh, the high voltage here, um, too, for the uh, different voltage potentials that are in the ion detection trap. Oh, high voltage warning. And here's the interface. So, uh, smaller pins for probably uh, data connections, and the higher uh, higher voltage goes through the three larger pins there. So probably a ground and two different high voltage potentials. Pretty cool. I like uh, the gold connectors there. You see that, Adam? The gold connectors. Oh yeah, they have those. Um little springy contacts on the inside. Yeah, those are neat. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And they got cutouts in there in order to... Oh, for the high it. voltage, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so as I was looking at the, the side here, so i uh, got these two inputs here. Yep. I'm betting that those inputs uh, go to these two right here, and this is ground level then. Yeah, that's probably right. Those are for the high voltage coming in, and then maybe one for... Uh, some sort of like analog protected signal out or another high voltage. Oh yeah, that could be an option too because uh, this one here on the side um, could be like coax out for uh, the signal, the analog signal. Yeah. Or digital. Yeah, it looks like bo all three have uh, silicone wires coming through them so they're probably all high voltage then. Pretty beefy capacitors back there too. Ceramics. Oh yeah. Some spark gaps. Probably uh, for uh, over discharge protection. Uh, neat. Very neat. It begins. Let it begin. All right, let's get inside of these uh, modules. All right, so here we have the uh, vacuum system and uh, the logic board. So. This handles basically all the thinking operations inside of the mass spectrometer. Take a look at it on the inside. Oh, the phone, the board, nope. All right. Take a look inside. So it looks like we have a bunch of uh, microcontrollers. This big lucent one here. MCM Motorola chip. Very nice uh, banks of capacitors. Oh, no, resistors. Capacitors too. A big old crystal oscillator here. Some flash chips manufactured by Intel. Now, there's two more uh, flash chips here. Those probably have uh, some of the ROMs on them for uh, operating the device. These could be, uh, they look like RAM chips. I bet those are RAM. And a lazy boy recliner. Yeah, and a little lazy boy recliner. Right there. Perfect size for anyone. Is, uh, relays, yeah? Uh, either relays or filters. They say K on them. Yeah, yeah. those are yeah, those are relays because they're Potter Brumfield. Yeah, okay. so those are definitely relays. All right. These are, uh, look like a little optocouplers. Yeah. Another crystal oscillator here. Um, what's this guy? I don't know, it's uh, an adjustable voltage regulator up here. Probably for one of the voltage rails. Very useful reset switch. Right over here that you can't access. Hit That's how you do it. Yeah. Let's get on to the next one. All right. Now that we don't have the uh, thinking makeshift tripod going on. All right. Now this module looks to be uh, all the DACs and stuff for uh, the vacuum gauges and sensors. So this would take all the analog information from those things and then send those digital signals to the logic board. Take a look at the inside. See what interesting stuff is in this one. 
So, got a bunch of Dax here. Pretty uh, large ones, probably good ones for the time. Yeah, this is still an interesting setup here. What'd you say that you thought this was for? It was for the ion gauge tube. I think it just uh, uh, controls the uh, analog signal from the ion gauge tube. Yeah, that would make it's sense. It's got a A to D converter on there too. And it is uh, for the vacuum gauge um, area on the front, so that makes perfect sense. There's quite a bit of going on over here. I can't imagine that's all for the ion gauge, so that's probably for another part of the system. This is interesting. It almost looks like a multiplier here. Oh yeah, I didn't even notice that before. That it obviously is some sort of multiplier. I wonder if that's for the gauge it's capacitors too. and diodes in a stack. Yeah. That is interesting. And this is completely isolated over here, so must be some sort of and you can tell it's high voltage because of all the dust that's collected on the components. Oh yeah, yeah, the, the the ionized it got stuck right to the board. Fair point. What what does this appear? Uh 15 volt regulator, yeah, positive 15 volt regulator up here. Another crystal oscillator. Yeah, these DAX do. That's probably just some logic. Yeah. Oh, hard to say. I don't know that part number. Yeah, I've never seen it either, but. Maybe op amps. Could be op amps. Take a look at that up close. Nice Xilinx uh, microcontroller here. I believe that's a microcontroller. It could be FPGA. What's interesting on the dust on this too, you can tell it's a uh, multiplier because as you can see, as it goes up the chain, yeah, it goes the, back and the, forth. The um, the uh, the uh, capacitor is getting increasingly dusty. Oh, that's a fair point. <laughs> you see that? <laughs> yeah, right here. So, so uh, the high voltage side, you can see there's very little dust here, and uh, it does get dustier and dustier. I wonder if that uh, that high voltage is for the ion gauge voltage. Um, yeah, generally, that runs at a very high current. That could be for like the uh, uh, other part of it, like maybe for the uh, filament, because okay. I believe the filament is a uh, raised uh, potential versus uh, versus at ground. So the next module here might be a little bit exciting, especially if you're a QPS. Now, what is a QPS? Well, that took a little bit of time to kind of figure out, but what I think this is is it's a, uh, a DSP with an analog front end. So this takes the uh, RF signals and it processes those through a couple of DACs as well. We yeah, a whole section right here which has an EMI shield on because it does... Double shield. Yeah, double shielded. It uh, handles the uh, RF sensor telemetry. Let's go ahead and take a look at the inside of there. I think these are the same uh, processors yeah, that were in that's, the. Uh, that's in the other one. Yeah, so. More deck goodness. I've got a couple of uh, really nice looking analog devices, DAX here. Probably a pretty decent speed, too, but it's handling things in the megahertz region. So uh, this probably uh, could be. Those capacitors. precision resistors or those capacitors? I can't Over tell. here? These black ones. Oh. Looks like they're spec parts with yeah, the little, the little white the resistors. dots Yeah, I believe they are resistors. You're talking about the, the boxes? Yeah, the little black Yeah, those, those are resistors. Oh, no, yeah. No, they're diodes. Oh, they're diodes. diodes here. Um, are, are, no, okay, yeah, you're right. They're resistors. It's just right next to that one diode. But yeah, those are, those are interesting. So what he's talking about are these... uh little uh, black boxes right here. Get some more light. More light. These little black boxes. So uh, he thinks that they're very, very, very tightly spec resistors, which makes sense because this does have to be pretty sensitive. Um, yeah, those are interesting. I'm not sure what those red ones are. Are those filters? These? Or those? Yeah. They say, they say K on them. Now, what was they the other thing that said K? Relays. They yeah. could be relays. Yeah. For uh, for switching the, the different uh, DACs and whatnot over. That must be what that is. Now, I'm not sure what these are, but it would make sense that these would be a type of DAC, too. That's a DAC for sure. Another analog devices. Linear technologies. So. 
Lots of good analog hardware in there. If you're looking for small signals, you need big expensive parts. And right. Lots of them. <laughs> Highly spec big expensive parts. A bunch of uh, voltage regulators here for all the different voltage rails for the operational amplifiers and uh, the microcontrollers or whatever the uh, large Xilinx processors are. To lift those up and look at the size of those tandems, they're big. Yeah, these are big tandems. They look like donut holes. <laughs> more couches. Yeah, more couches. You got, you got enough for the whole family. Pretty nice stuff. Pretty nice stuff. I can appreciate good analog hardware. So this one's a fun one. This is a high voltage power supply. And uh, it has some interesting connectors that are uh, pretty well insulated in the back. Just for that reason. You can see one of those high voltage plugs here. Two more here. Those, uh, those might go up to the sensor head. Yeah, they yeah. probably do. Either the sensor head or one of the quadrupoles. Probably the quadrupoles, actually. No, because the quadrupoles are driven by the other one. Ah, uh, okay. Oh. So uh, inside, we have a couple of boxes. Uh, each one of these boxes here that are larger has a CHW voltage multiplier. Or two, two of them. So... Overall, pretty nice. Looks like pretty low current. Uh, nice resistors for uh, discharging. I think that's for uh, discharging when they're not in use. Uh, probably. Probably high value in the meg ohm, 10 meg ohm, 100 meg. Yeah. Discharging the multiplier. And then we have uh, another section in here. There's uh, like two more multipliers, little ones. So, want to open this one? Yeah, sure. I think the screws on this one got a bit crunchy. Yeah, the, the plastic definitely got hot in here. Yeah, just a little bit of a smaller multiplier with like uh, breakouts at different stages, it looks like. And a big old ceramic cap in the center. 10 kV, that could be final output. Yeah, yeah. And then this is a spark gap. So that limits the voltage from going over a peak. Spark gaps are uh, surprisingly handy. They come in a lot of ranges too. Oh yeah. More uh... They generally okay. use a nickel 63 uh, isotope too as a... Uh, uh, for uh, creating ionization inside the spark gap too so it breaks down at the exact voltage that they set it at. There's uh, different gas mixtures too in some of them I think. Oh yeah, absolutely. The voltage regulators, yeah, those are voltage regulators. Uh, oh yeah, operational amplifiers in this section then. Motorola, MC, huh? Yeah, those, uh, linear technology, yeah, those. Definitely analog stuff in there. Yeah, these all look pretty similar to one another, too. Yeah, it probably does some sort of PM, PWM management that uh, goes and feeds the... Um, the multipliers? The multipliers. I wonder if these are for uh, charging the multipliers. I'm sure they are, yeah, because it takes in a small AC signal, a couple hundred volts, and then multiplies it up from there. I'm betting then, I mean, taking a look at uh, this chip and uh, this chip, uh, they look to be... Oh, they're not the same part number, are they? Oh, what is this one? LT7109. Yeah, this one and uh, this one are the same. So these could be for uh, driving the transformers. The some PWM generator switch mode chips. If uh, if that's the case, then yeah. now these definitely do look like voltage regulators. Regulators, but uh, I'm trying to trying to find what would switch these transformers. Like, I can't think it's just done by, like, that little transistor right what here. Are these right here? These? Yeah. Mm, MC340 72AP. MC would make me think microcontroller, but I doubt that's the case. Maybe. I could look it up and uh, throw the information on uh, in captions. Awesome. Uh, oh, yeah, you can see right here the high voltage uh, leads that go into those the back plugs oh and then uh, wasn't there a, yeah there's a 
Somebody didn't do a very good job yeah. soldering on the high voltage end on there. All the electrons are going to leak out. Nice sharp point right there. Right there. Shame. 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 Yeah. That's about it for uh, this module. Personally, I like this one. I think this one's the funnest one. It has potential. It is. <laughs> <laughs> it has potential. The next module is the high voltage uh, switching supply for the lens features on the quadrupole mass analyzer. So this is what I think gives us a solid DC uh, voltage reference to control the confinement of the, the uh, ion stream. We have a couple of fairly decent uh, transistors and MOSFETs at uh, 200 volts at uh, 9 amps. Yeah. And yeah, 9 amps. 9 amps. That's what it was. I uh, got a couple of opto isolators here, some uh, high voltage operational amplifiers. Uh, this section looks for uh, possibly a feedback and tuning because it has all the uh, the test points. Uh, it could be uh, the, the voltage rails too on the front. Nice capacitors. That looks like a transformer. A relay. See anything uh, jumping out and being interesting? Not really, but I do like the fact that they went ahead and masked off the layout of each individual high voltage uh, power oh, yeah, supply. Yeah. That's kind of nice when you're trying to troubleshoot something like that. Yeah, the layout's wonderful. Yeah. I wonder if uh, these are run in uh, series to get the higher voltage. Because I think it's a Could be. couple of thousand volts for the, uh, the DC potential. Could very well be. Yeah, look at the lower voltage ones here, 22 volt. Yeah. I didn't never even notice those until just now. Lots of uh, power switching in there. What is this over here? Oh, that's yeah. probably a choke. Could be. Uh, it's a UH, so uh inductor of some sort. Yeah. Maybe. Micro Henry's. Nice setup. All right, in this box we have the quadrupole amplifier. So I believe that this one handles switching the high side of the uh, RF output to the quadrupole mass analyzer. So this would superimpose the uh, RF on top of the DC potential that's on the quadrupole, or it would put the uh, RF switching on a different portion of the quadrupole. And what this does is uh, it uh, sends out the uh, higher RF potential and uh, gets a signal from probably the exciter and then amplifies that out. So this handles the high side switching for that. We got a whole bunch of uh, MOSFETs here. And these are 1,000 volts at one amp, so it definitely could handle a couple of thousand volts between the array. If I remember correctly, it's three and three in uh, so series. Or, uh, yeah. Yeah, series. So uh, each one of these sections would be uh, three uh, MOSFETs that are in series. So 3,000 volts per stage, and it looks like an H bridge. Got some uh, really interesting custom uh, precision resistors right here which could be very well uh, tuned for doing that uh, either uh, oscillation like correction like an LC network or yeah. for measuring uh, current and the reason why I say it could be a uh, part of the, uh, the balancing for the uh, frequency is because it does have some capacitors close to it are those packages stuck together too it looks like they're actually glued yeah they are they are glued together so I, I wonder if they come from the factory glued together like that. Yeah. It's really weird. Yeah, it must be. Um, they, they obviously made some sort of high voltage divider array out of them because sometimes you can get these in, in divider packages, mm -hmm. but it looks like these are just single resistor packages, and then they stuck them together in some sort of divider array network. Which is really weird because I've never seen them stuck together like that. Yeah, it could be for uh, doing multiple things at that point. Definitely some witchery in there I've never seen before. It's crazy. 
Yeah, I'm not, uh, not completely sure what I'm looking at either, but uh, it's gorgeous. Over here. I guarantee you they charge a pretty penny for all that. With uh, with 3,000 volts to work with per leg, you can charge a lot of things with this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, over here, uh, a lot of these are voltage regulators. That's a voltage regulator. That's an interesting 5 lead component right here. I have to take a look at see what that is. Zoom up on those. Can I? Yeah. Take a look at what exactly these are. These five liter components. So interesting stuff going there. And again, you can see which uh, leads from the uh, connector had the high voltage on because you can see where the dust was collecting. Oh yeah. On there, so you can see where where the high voltage was coming in. These uh, these darker points he's talking about. Uh, once again, the, uh, the high voltage ionizes dust particulates in the air. They build up a charge and stick to there. But wouldn't that be uh, wouldn't that be the grounds then? They get dusty. Um, it would be a negative charge either way. Yeah. I don't even know how to find what the, what the high voltage pins are on the power supply. Just look for the dust. Yeah. Find them real quick. There's quite a bit of dust here too by these. Capacitors, they're pretty dusty. Flavor country. <laughs> Flavor country. Yeah, the color between these two, they don't even look like uh, the same cap anymore. No, they don't. And they collect that really fine dust particulate, too. Well, they actually use uh, electrostatics for painting in the same way, don't they? Oh, yeah, exactly, like um, powder coating. Right, exactly. The more custom, uh, not custom inductors, uh, well, 40 uh, micro Henry. That is a, a pretty odd value. I don't really see like 47 micro Henry or something. Yeah, they're definitely meant to handle a little bit of current because they're fairly decent size. Interesting capacitors. Oh no, those aren't capacitors. Oh, they're also inductors. Where? These? Right here. No, those got to be capacitors. U oh no, UF. Never mind. Yeah, those are capacitors. These are strange ones, though. Yeah, that's more of an older style. Yeah, you don't see too much uh, equipment built anymore with axial lead capac uh, electrolytics anymore, you know? Yeah. It's not like they didn't have the space to put uh, coaxial lead capacitors in there. A relay there on the top. Probably another uh, optocoupler here. Yeah, that's nice. And lastly but not leastly, we have this module, which is also inside of the machine. Go ahead and take a look at what's inside of this one. Oh, shit. Well, my work here is done. Now, this is the ion gauge tube out of the mass spectrometer. Uh, it has a uh, silvered uh, lining uh, flashed inside of the tube. So I picked a, uh, another tube I have in stock that has a clear glass bulb uh, for uh, showing how these work. Um, but uh, basically an ion gauge tube is a uh, just sim very similar to a vacuum tube that you'd find in a TV or an amplifier. Um, however, it's open to air, so it does not contain a vacuum, and that's what this uh, flange and neck is for, is for attaching to your vacuum chamber of the device you want to measure the vacuum pressure in. Uh, an ion gauge tube works a little different compared to other vacuum gauges in that it actually uh, ionizes any gas trapped inside the system and uh, by reading the amount of uh, ionized particles hitting the collector it's able to determine the gas pressure uh, left inside of the unit um, so anyway um, what you can see here barely is down the center attached to this electrode right here is what's called a collector which is just a very uh, small collector basically of electrons or ions as they're discharged 
This right here is the filament. It's made of a different material than normal filaments are because this can be exposed to air. It won't burn in air for very long, but it's uh, beefier than a normal filament you'd find in a in a vacuum tube. As you can see there, the gray shiny part there is the filament, and that will uh, glow white hot when the tube is running. Um, the spiral that you see uh, on the uh, uh, on the inside there would be the grid, so that's used to accelerate the electrons uh, that are emitted from the cathode to the anode as it's collecting ions, and then the ions would slam into the small thin wire that's the collector and there in the center, and then that would provide a feedback to the instrumentation as ions are collected that there's still gas in the system, and that'll get you your number. So basically this is just a metal glass to metal seal right here and then this is connected in multitude of different ways but in this particular case there's an o-ring seal inside here that's connected to a KF flange. Uh, KF flanges are very similar to tri-clamp flanges that are used in fluid connections in the food industry and you'd have an o-ring uh, with a seal here and then a clamp that goes between two of these uh, identical mating surfaces in order to produce a vacuum seal. So that gives you a kind of an idea of what an ion gauge tube looks like and a brief description of how they work. Here's one of the most interesting pieces of technology inside of this whole system. This is a turbo molecular pump and uh, it has a little filter and this is basically just to catch any really big particulates that may enter into the pump area from the vacuum chamber you're trying to pump down. But what's really cool about this is the best way to describe it is like a jet engine built backwards. And uh, we have a lot of these fins here. And these fins rotate on the turbo pump shaft like this. And underneath those fins there are stationary stators. And uh, these fins, there's so many of them, so it increases the surface area and therefore the percentage of uh, impacts that can be uh, made and allow the air molecules to bounce off and down in through the turbo pump but it's a little different than uh, like a normal vacuum pump because it doesn't have seals it's more so a kinetic kind of pump where it really is just uh, waiting for the last bit of air molecules to make it into the area so there can be uh, the physical uh, collision and uh, exiting of the chamber but this is for pumping down to really low vacuums and uh, on the other side is uh, the area for the multi-phase motor. I uh, don't see any sensor on the bottom of this one, so they probably use the feedback from the windings. Yes, it does. Uh, just like an ESC for a drone does. So uh, we actually power these up using some of the uh, ESCs from drones. It uh, works kind of well. Depends on the turbo pump. There's a smaller one that uh, Adam's going to let me tear down in another video, but this one looks pretty good in uh, working condition. So we're going to leave this one in one piece. Uh, Adam, any uh, honorable mentions on turbo pump technology? Uh, yeah, I think you pretty much covered it all. There's generally about 11 stages of blades inside of here where, where it's moving blades and stators. Um, these generally run on some very interesting greases and very expensive to relubricate these because it has to be a grease that does not outgas or, uh, or uh, uh, cause any contamination in the vacuum system. And then this KF fitting right here would connect to the roughing pump. So that would be either a piston pump or a rotary vein vacuum pump. And that basically does what's called the rough pumping and basically gets the vacuum, you know, down to uh, low pressures. And then from here, the turbo pump does the job of cleaning up any residual gas bouncing around inside the system. So that pretty much covers it. Yeah, it's a very it, simple three-phase motor. These generally run like 60 to 80,000 RPM for, for a turbo pump like this. Yeah, in the video I uh, mentioned the uh, roughing pump where uh, this takes care of like the last 5 to 2 percent of whatever molecules or atoms are floating around. Exactly. It's probably a turbo molecular pump because even when you're talking about gases, it's usually a, a, a diatomic molecule. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And that's where uh, the ion gauge comes in, in, into play because uh, for a normal roughing pump you can use a uh, thermal electric or uh, Perini gauge to measure the vacuum pressure uh, uh, or a simple diaphragm uh, for measuring the pressures. But once you start getting to the pumping, 
that this is capable of pumping those gauges no longer work so then you have to go with something like an ion gauge in order for the uh, for the pumping to be registered it's a, it's a very specific piece of equipment because uh, if you didn't know exactly what a turbo molecular pump was you look at this thing is that what is it, some kind of a weird fan or fluid pump or something but uh It'll be interesting taking one of those apart. Something I have yet to do, but uh, I've seen well, at least one video of tearing them down, and they look like a jigsaw puzzle from the underworld. Yeah, they're built very similar to a jet engine. They just they can't run at atmospheric pressures at speeds because when they do run at atmospheric at pressure uh, at, at, at speeds, they explode. Basically, all these turbines would just disintegrate inside. <laughs> Turns into quite a uh, quite a wreck, and that's something. Uh, though the older ones, uh, they used to really explode. From uh, what you were telling me, they'd have to encase them in like concrete or something. You know, oh yeah, like, absolutely. Yeah, the, the casings were much thicker because the blades were generally heavier in in the larger pumps, and uh, they 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 uh, they would eject blades out of the casing if the casing wasn't thick enough. Absolutely, it's just it's the engineering is absolutely beautiful. Absolutely, yeah, it's got very beautiful. very high tolerances. And uh, the bearings, also excellent quality. Fancy piece of hardware. Well, this has been fun, Adam. Anytime, I enjoy this stuff just as much as you do. And if you're interested in high tech stuff, go ahead and uh, visit Adam's ebay store i'll link that below down in the description I'm sure you'll find it all as entertaining as i do i'm always learning new stuff every time i come over i had no idea what a quadruple mass analyzer was until uh, two days ago and i didn't know exactly how they worked until about two days ago <laughs> i'm sure i made some errors i'll have to look up some information to throw up in the video but yeah hopefully it's pretty informative or at least interesting it's always something interesting to learn yeah i'll thank you much for your time adam it was fun and everybody else, as always, stay tuned for more.